our service will be on fellowship tab cincinnati.com later this afternoon for our folks we've been doing two services a week we're only going to do one service today because it's easter that's the way it was planned out in our calendar and we hope you enjoy this we're starting right up front with the fellowship ensemble this morning so enjoy our singing and prepare for the message from pastor todd Yeah. 
said I'd had a victory. You said you'd come to save. Oh, but now you're in the grave. Very early that third morn, before the dawn had come, demons danced around, chanting, Satan, you have won. But God, in all of his greatness, he stood up from the throne. He nodded to the angel to roll away the storm. The sun began to rise. He opened up his eyes. The father stood and said, My son's no longer dead. And the angels filled the sky. The heavens shout. The demons cry. favorite times of the year are Christmas and Easter. I love it. Got to thinking what I was going to do and I thought, well, uh, I'll do the traditional and I'll take it uh, uh, from the Calvary and I'll take it all the way to the tomb. And um, But uh, as I got to thinking about Jesus in his life, I thought, you know what? I'm going to do a message on the life and times of Jesus. The life and times of Jesus. So I'm going to start from the time of his birth and I'm going to take you from the time where he's coming back and where the kingdom will be rolled out and the things that are going to be taking place. So I'm just going to kind of take you through the life and times of Jesus. And by the way, we're not able to meet together as much as I would love to and as uh, much as we wanted Don up here leading us in this singing and stuff. Uh, we're not able to get together with people. So uh, I'm going to give you a minute uh, where you're, wherever you're at watching. Go get your Easter bonnets on. Uh, come back out and sit on the couch and uh, for the men, go ahead and get your suits on, uh, your new suits you got last year for Easter. And then for the kids, get all your Easter candy out and sit on the couch and get ready to listen. I'm going to take, as I take you through the life of Jesus, there'll be many things that you've heard and there's going to be some things maybe you haven't heard. So stick with me as we go through. I'll be quickly touching different sections of this as we go through. I'm going to be starting out, of course, where do you start out at somebody's beginning? except for at the beginning. So we'll be starting out in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. This will be a launching pad to the place where we're going. So stick with me and as we go through this. The life and times of Jesus. For those that are able to stand, you can stand for the 11 that are here, counting Jesus 12. And uh, so we got the 12 here. And uh, for those that are out there, you can stay seated if you want, wherever you're at. Uh, we're going to take an overview picture of the birth and life, death, and resurrection of this man called Jesus. 
He's the Son of God, the Savior of the world, Emmanuel, which means God with us. Think about this. Alpha and Omega, he's the beginning and the end. He's the Christ, the Son of the Blessed. He's a deliverer. He's our everlasting life. He's the finisher of our faith, Jehovah, King of kings. He's Lord of lords. He's Messiah. He's the Nazarene. He's our only begotten. He's a preacher, prophet, priest, and he's the potter. He's the prince. He's the great physician. He is a quickening spirit. He is our redeemer, our refuge. He is our restorer, our resurrection, our rock, our root, our rod, a ruler. And he's also the seed of Abraham. He's the seed of woman. Truth, unspeakable gift, the vine, the wisdom of God, X, which marks his spot. The young child, full of zeal of God. I'm talking about this man, yes, by the name of Jesus. We're beginning at his birth. And so the first point will be his virgin birth. And we're going to begin to read in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, that when his mother, Mary, was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with the child of the Holy Ghost. And Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her her way privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost." And she shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sin. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from the sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. And he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Oh, the name of Jesus. Lord, we're so thankful we're able to meet here today. What a blessed day. Easter, the day of your resurrection. God, I just pray right now, Lord, for a little while, God, as we assemble together and we learn about your life as, uh, Lord, you grew up, the things you went through, the things that you did for us. God, that we may place some things in our heart and realize, God, all that you did, your life was consumed about the cross. Everything you did, God, even when you went and you took uh, uh, Peter, Ch James, and John with you and you went up there and, Lord, you looked and you began to talk. Uh, uh, Lord, you talked about the cross all the time. Everywhere you went, you talked about the cross. The cross was always on your mind. God, may it be on our mind today. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> you be seated. The life and times of Jesus, his virgin birth. I want to see the prophecy of his birth. We'll see the, uh, the presence of his birth and the power of his birth as we look through. Written over 700 years before Christ was even born, yet Isaiah, he gives reference to the virgin birth. His life, death, and also his resurrection. In fact, in Isaiah 7, 4, it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. 700 years before this was done, it was already prophesied for that. He said, by the way, he said, this, this young man will choose good, and he will refuse evil. And boy, that's exactly what he did all his life. The only virgin to ever conceive, not man's seed, but woman's seed which we would say is God's seed. In Genesis 3.15, God says, And I will put enmity, talking to the serpent, between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. You think, how does woman have a seed? Well, the seed was the virgin birth. The only virgin birth ever to take place, the only virgin, listen, it cannot be duplicated. Thank God for the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. And we see that when he was born, uh, Jesus told that old serpent, listen, he's going he's gonna to crush your head. And that's exactly what Jesus did at Calvary. He crushed the head of Satan. And it was a death blow. And when you crush the head of a serpent or a snake, when the sun comes down, the snake will completely die. Until then, he's just squirming. He, he's, he's alive, but only through the crush of death. And when the sun comes down, he's finally done. I'm going to tell you, one day the sun's coming down, and he's finally going to be finished. Someone else say amen. <clears throat> so we see this take place. And it'll bruise his heel. We know that at Calvary, the worst part of bruising upon a man's body is his heels. 
So we see uh, how that old Satan, uh, he bruised the heels of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but how Jesus took the death blow upon him. Praise be to God. The only true immortal life in sinless blood. Remember, life is in the blood. Aren't you glad for that? And it's the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. Praise God. The true miraculous birth, given account of at least six months time in the, or six times in the scriptures. So we see over and over and over again about this miraculous birth, the virgin birth. Uh, we see in 1 John 4, 9, and this this was manifest in love of God toward us because God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might uh, live through him. The reason why Jesus was brought into the world as a virgin birth is that we might live through him. Jesus sent into the world by this Holy Spirit and the power and the presence of God to save a lost and dying world. That's why he was born. That's why he came. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So we see and we thank God for the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Number two, we see his visual childhood. I want to look for a minute at his childhood and the people within his childhood. We see the first thing as he's getting, as, uh, when he's born, we see Gabriel. He goes and he's a messenger of God and how he visits with uh, Elizabeth and uh, uh, Zachariah because of John the Baptist getting ready to be born. But then also he visits with Joseph and Mary. We see six months the elder John leaps in Elizabeth's womb when he hears the salvation of the blessedness of Mary and the birth of Jesus Christ. When John is born, Zacharias asks and calls for writing in a tablet. He writes down his name shall be John and he's freed and able to speak. Before that he was dumb in the temple. Six months later, time for taxes and here we go again. Uh, Mary says, I'm going to go with you. And she goes with uh, uh, Joseph and they begin to make their way to Bethlehem. When they get to Bethlehem, there's no places to lodge. And so they have to find their place in a, in a cavern, in a cave, uh, in a place where they put the animals and they find their place there. But she's due now to give birth. And uh, she gives birth to this Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. She wraps him in swaddling clothes and she lays him in a manger. Here they are in a cave uh, where animals stay. But upon her birth, uh, there's an announcement made. It comes from heaven where the heavenly choir begins to sing. And the angels come down and tell the shepherds they're told about Jesus' birth. Uh, he, and he's lying in a manger. You need to go see him and give reverence to him. The shepherds from the, he, the fields begin to make their way. And they make their way to this cave. And they bow down and they give, uh, uh, they give uh, uh, ominous to Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. Simeon, before he dies, he said, I just want to see uh, the son of God, the savior of the world. And the just and devout aged man, he holds Christ in the temple. My eyes have seen thy salvation, and he's able to die. Anna, we see, an aged woman whose name means full of grace, a devout saintly woman praying for the coming of the Messiah. She gave thanks for the redemption in Jerusalem when she sees Jesus. Now, home in Nazareth, Jesus is the carpenter's son, but only temporarily. He's only a caretaker, Joseph is. One year passes, time for taxes again. But this time Joseph goes by himself to pay the taxes in Jerusalem. The host of wise men from the east have begun to make their way to see Jesus. These men are known as the stargazers. We know them as the wise men. We call them the three wise men because of the three gifts. But there are many, many wise men that gather together. They prepare this journey. It's a great journey they make from the east. And as they make this journey, it's almost a year's time and now has passed. And had looked uh, for years, the star, they looked for this star. When the star appeared, they knew a king would be underneath this star. They called it the king's star. And so they mapped it out. They knew where it was. And they got all their provision together. They got all their gifts together. They got the command from east. And they began to make their way uh, to bring the gifts and to bow reverence to this king. Once they get there, they finally go and they thought they'd go to Jerusalem. We we'll ask where the king, we'll go to the king there and ask him where the star is or where it was. And whom uh, the star has shines upon, this is the king. And they go to Herod and the king and the king says, I don't know. I'll ask my priests and I'll ask my scribes. And they simply say in the scriptures, it says in Bethlehem he'll be born. So sure enough, uh, they look and they said, he says, go to Bethlehem and when you find him, give praise and honor to him. And then tell me where he is so I can go and worship him. 
We know that's really a plot. We know what he's getting ready to do. Uh, the plot that he wants to do, he come back and tell me who he is and I can go and worship him. He don't want to worship him. He wants to slay him. He wants to make sure his line stays the kingly line. As written, <clears throat> the wise men leave and as they go, all of a sudden now nighttime appears. As nighttime appears, the star begins to shine again, but the, the star does something this time. The Bible says it goes before them. I want you to know this star is an unusual star. It shows up out of the mist, out of nowhere. But this star don't only do that, this star moves. And it began to move from Bethlehem and begin to take them to the house where Jesus is. In fact, it says, until it came to rest over the house. This star literally came and rested over the house where Jesus was. He's not a baby anymore. In fact, this is what the Bible says. They come and it rests over the young child. He is now a young child, about one year of age. And with Mary, his mother, in the house. Where's Joseph? He's out paying taxes. Being warned, they go another way home, but they leave great treasures. They leave gold, which represents his kingship. They leave frankincense, which represents his deity. And they leave myrrh, which represents his death. This is why when Herod realizes the wise men are not coming back, he makes a decree to kill all the babies in Bethlehem and all the coasts thereof from two years of age and under. He knew Jesus was about one year old. So he went a year above it and a year under it. And he made sure he killed all the children he get trying to kill Jesus. We see the passageway that brings them, that brings uh, Joseph and Mary and Jesus. And God had warned Joseph and Mary to flee to Egypt. And upon the death of Herod, to come back again. And they come back and they settle down in Nazareth. And that's why he's known as a carpenter from Nazareth. <clears throat> this brings us to point three. His veiled years. Now from two years of age to 12. The, this is what, the only thing we have of him from two to 12. This child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom and grace. And God was upon him. So we see, secret, we see a secret 10 years. We just hear in these 10 years that he grew with wisdom and knowledge and strength. This is what we realize. And then we all of a sudden see he comes on the scene and they're seeking Jesus. So we see not only the secret 10 years, but then uh, as they sought his mother and father for three days at age 12 in Luke 2. They left Jerusalem after the custom of the feast, not realizing they left Jesus one day's journey to go back to seek for him. So Joseph and Mary now are looking for him, 12 years old, and they lose their son. How can you lose Jesus, the son of the living God? Where did they find him? They found him where they left him, in the temple. And he said, why did you seek me? In other words, why did you have to seek me out? Why did you have to look for me? Didn't you know where I'd be? He said, I must be about my father's business. So there he is in the temple, working and telling and expounding the scriptures. Now, it says... We're going to see the silent 18 years of Jesus Christ. Before this, we have a verse that gives this into his silent 18 years. It says, he increased in wisdom and stature and with favor with God and with man. So we see 18 years. A total of 28 years are kind of obscured to us that we see. And this brings us into the next part, and that is his virtuous life. And thank God for the virtuous life of Jesus Christ called the life and ministry. It's called his ministry upon, upon this earth. In fact, some say it's from age 30 to 33. It'd be more accurate to say from age 30 to 33 and a half. So we see his virtuous life. The first part in this is the messenger, the man. I see first John the Baptist shows up. Remember old John the Baptist? Uh, you know Jesus' cousin? He shows up preaching in the wilderness saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and be baptized. You bunch of heathens, you vipers. He's out there. He's kind of a wild man. He's preparing the way of the Lord. His cousin's preparing his way. He baptized people in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Now we go from, listen, by the way, here comes Jesus. We go to Jesus, the Messiah. Jesus comes to Galilee of Jordan and says, John, I need you to baptize me. Hey, cousin, I need you to baptize me. John says, behold, the Lamb of God. This is the Son of the This is the one I'm representing. This is He. He says, I can't baptize you. He said, let it be so. We must fulfill the scripture. It's got to be done. 
So John baptizes him. And as Jesus is coming up out of the water, we see the heavens open and the dove landing upon Jesus' shoulder. And we hear God speak from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son. If any mistakes were given about it, God made sure you knew who Jesus Christ was right here. This is my beloved Son. This is my beloved Son. <clears throat> Once Jesus is baptized, we see something else that takes place. And now from the baptism, he goes to temptation. Forty days he goes into the wilderness. He is tempted of Satan. And he, and he fasts 40 days and 40 nights. And we see now he begins to make his travel from here forward. He travels around 3,300 miles in the next three and a half years. Talking and ministering and doing miracles. I talked to you about the messenger. I want to talk to you about the few few of the miracles. And Jesus turns water into wine at the wedding in Canaan. That's the beginning of the miracles that begin to take place. There are at least 37 uh, individual um, uh, miracles that are Jesus is recorded, but he does many, many, many others. Even one where he says he, he continued to heal until the evening. Another one, he healed all night. And then a few other scriptures says he healed many sick and that, that were oppressed. Another scripture says many were sick at, at Gennesaret as he touched him, as they touched his garment were healed. So all over and over, thousands upon thousands that were healed and touched that we don't even realize. We see Jesus heals the uh, Peter's mother-in-law, sick of fever. I don't know, maybe you have fever today. Jesus can still heal. Jesus heals the centurion, paralyzed servant. Jesus heals a paralytic down from the roof. They lowered him down in and Jesus looks up. He sees their faith. He heals him. Jesus heals the deaf and the dumb. Jesus heals the blind at Bethsaida. Jesus heals a boy with the unclean spirit. Jesus heals a crippled uh, woman of 18 years. Jesus heals a man with dropsy. Jesus, on the way to heal and raise from the dead, Jairus' daughter. <clears throat> She's 12 years old. She's been in good health for 12 years. All of a sudden, there's a major need. She gets really sick. There's a woman that's following who's been sick for 12 years. These same 12 years that Jairus has been enjoying his daughter, this woman has been sick and spent everything she had on her physicians. <clears throat> she now has nothing left. She hears Jesus is on his way. She makes her way to Jesus as Jesus is going with Jairus. She falls down and touches the hem of his garment. And the Bible says immediately, healing virtue went out. I'm telling you what, if you have faith today, healing virtue still goes out today. Jesus is still in the healing business. He healed not only her, but he went and also healed Jairus' daughter. He cleanses the man of leprosy. He calmed the raging storm. He cast out the demons in the herd of swine. Jesus healed the man with a withered hand and restored it whole. Jesus fed 5,000 with five fish and two loaves. Jesus cleanses the ten lepers. Jesus raised the widow's son of Nain from the dead. Jesus raises his friend Lazarus from the dead. As he stands out and speaks, Lazarus come forth and out forth. The stone was rolled back and Lazarus came walking forth out of the tomb. Jesus, we see the messenger. We see his miracles through his life, constantly doing good. And we see, I want to show you just for a minute, his majesty, his sovereign power. Jesus still heals today. <clears throat> Jesus still does miracles today. February 12th, 1979, on a Monday night around 7 p.m., using a kitchen chair as my altar, in my living room, he saved my soul from a devil's hell. And he saved my wife on February 18th, 1979. He saved my oldest daughter, Christy, on Feb or September 26th, 1996. He saved my daughter, Chelsea, on April 14th, 1998. He saved my youngest daughter, Caitlin, on March 19th, 1999. And he's still saving lives today. He's still healing people today. He's still helping people today. He's still in the saving business. Amen. We see his virtuous life. It continued all through his life. And then we see his venomous adversary. I'm going to tell you, he had a venomous adversary that was against him. Number five, the devil, the old serpent. <clears throat> he, his name is Lucifer, meaning morning star. The ruler of demons, the God of this world. He is known as the accuser of the brethren. 
the prince of the power of the air, the ruler of darkness, the roaring lion, the dragon, the adversary, the tempter, Beelzebub, Baal, uh, uh, Belial, uh, the Slewfoot, the wicked one, the Antichrist, and the list goes on and on and on. This same one, he is opposed to him at every turn, always trying to get him, even wanting to put this man, Jesus Christ, to death. His main goal is to crucify him. His main goal is to kill him, make a public example of him. And he'll do that very thing. He has a venomous adversary. He also has vicious enemies. Think about the enemies of number point six, the vicious enemies. Not only do we see the devil and demons and fallen angels, but we see spiritual wickedness in high places. We see the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the priests, the high priests, the scribes, the high officials and the leaders and the hypocrites. The enemies were against him and against you. They're against him at his birth. They tried to slay him at his birth. They tried to kill him at birth. They were against him through his life. And when the Bible was being written, they tried everything they can do to get rid of this good old Bible. Praise God, we still have the Bible today. Against the brethren, the wicked, I'm going to tell you, uh, Satan and all these onslaughts and all, they're against him. In Psalms 22, it says, even the bulls of Bashan came out. The ravening lions came out. The dogs come past me, Jesus said. The wicked have enclosed upon me, Jesus said. Here they are. Jesus said in one place, he said, the king's answer. Verily I say unto you, and so much as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. I want you to know he's also going to do it to you. And he said, Jesus said to Peter, think about this. Satan has desired to have you, Peter, that he may sift you as wheat. That's exactly what he wanted to do, is sift him. But he said, I have prayed for you. Aren't you glad? Uh, don't you think the world is your friend? Don't you think you don't have enemies? If you love Jesus Christ, the world is your enemy. The Bible says the world hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world, Jesus said. If the world hates you, Jesus said, know this, it hated me first. And the Bible says friendship of the world is enmity with God. The Bible says if any man love the world, then the love of the Father is not in him. I want you to know the enemies of Jesus Christ are the enemies of ours today. Uh, the, the wicked one, the venomous adversary of Jesus Christ is our enemy today. The devil's our enemy. Uh, the, uh, the vicious enemies that he has are still our enemies today. And they're known many times through people, wickedness in high places. We see number eight, <clears throat> not only the enemies, but his vicarious death. We see the atonement that takes place. The three religious trials, the three Roman trials, and the one public trial or people trial. As we look at this, the trials of God to old Golgotha and ends in the resurrection and glory. Starts out in the Garden of Gethsemane, leads us to the trials of God, goes on to Golgotha, and ends at the resurrection and glory. Gethsemane means oil press. This is where he went to pray. And this is the very place when he really got down to pray and needed his disciples with him to pray, they fell asleep. He went a little farther. He got down on his hands and knees. He finally comes to a place where he sweat as it were great drops of blood. Scientifically, it's possible for a man to be underneath so much stress to be able to, to take from the sweat from his capillaries to, uh, to uh, sweat out blood. And I see Jesus as he's sweating blood there in the garden, thinking about what he's getting ready to go through. This awful cup. He wants his cup to pass from him because he's man. But yet he knows his cup cannot pass from him because he's God. Hmm. He sweat as it were great drops of blood, but he finally says, nevertheless, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. Let your will be done. What a vicarious death. It was Judas when he comes to betray him. And we see the seven mock trials as they begin. <clears throat> the first Adam, he lost his rights to live in the garden. But in the second Adam, it bought back the right. In the first Adam, sin was concealed in himself from the garden. 
But in the second Adam, sin was open, and he poured himself out in the garden. In the first garden, or first Adam, God uh, had to give a blood sacrifice. But in the second Adam, he became the blood sacrifice. In the first Adam, he, uh, he brought judgment in the garden. But in the second Adam, he brought justice and salvation in the garden. This is what Jesus has brought to us. Trial one before Annas, around 3.30 a.m. Annas, by the way, 20 years before this, by the law, he was considered to be the high priest of Israel. And because they put him in, it's a life sentence by the Jews. But when Roman took over, and when Rome ha had power over Israel, they said, no longer, you have too much power as being the high priest, we're going to put somebody else in. So they take out Annas and put Caiaphas in, which was a son-in-law, by the way. So they put him in. So this leads us to why some get confused. Was Annas the high priest at the time? Or was Caiaphas the high priest at the time? Annas was the high priest of the Jews. Caiaphas was the high priest uh, uh, given by the Romans. So we see the trials that took place. <clears throat> so we begin to look down through and go through them. We see the trial before, first was before Annas. The second trial took place before Caiaphas. The position of the high priest by the Romans. The third trial before the great Sanhedrin council. They take Jesus here as soon as it becomes day. They try and make it official. Officially trying the case in the room of the temple. Made up of 70 members known as the council. This is the great Sanhedrin. They set up in Jerusalem in the seats of Moses. This is considered their divine place of authority. Here the Sanhedrin are. That's 24 chief priests. That's 24 elders. That's 22 scribes. And that's one high priest. 70 plus 1. This makes up the Sanhedrin. The great Sanhedrin. Trial number 4. They finally decided we need to put him to death. But we can't do it. We got to do it. We can't do it in our customs. We got to do it. Uh, take him to the Romans. So they take him before Pilate. <clears throat> Probably around 5 a.m. right now. They're, they bring Jesus before Pilate. He's a, a procurator of Palestine, representative of Caesar, now abiding in Caesarea, demanding the death penalty, which they cannot execute, so they bring him to Pilate. Pilate hears, by the way, that he's a Galilean. Pilate says, listen, I don't believe this man is, is, is guilty of anything. When he hears he's a Galilean, he says, I'm just going to send him to old Herod. And sure enough, that brings us to trial five where we see he's, Jesus comes before Herod Antipas. This is the one that killed John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus. This is the one Jesus said, that man is a fox. He said, that's the fox? By the way, when he's there, he couldn't wait to get Jesus in front of him and make him speak to him. And Jesus never, made a, never, never said a word, wouldn't open his mouth. This made Herod very uncomfortable. Herod begins to mock him, begins to ridicule him, begins to show contempt to him, puts him, uh, puts a robe upon him, white and sparkling, and, and a silver robe, and then has him led around uh, by, a, uh, by, by a slave and has him led around. He is being led around by a slave and mocked in the streets by Herod. Herod, when he does everything he can do to disclaim Jesus Christ, sends him back to Pilate. Pilate has him the second time. Pilate examines him again the second time and says, I find no fault in him. I will chastise him and release him. That's what I'll do. Jesus has been hit, beaten, smitten, smote upon, smacked, mocked, ridiculed, has a reed placed in his hand, has a crown of thorns crushed upon his head. His back has been ripped open all because of what? Because he loved you and me. He went through all this for one reason, because he loved you and he loved me. Amen. That's the reason why Jesus did this. And this brings us to the last and final trial. Trial seven before the people. Herod says, I'll give them a chance. I'll tell you what, I'll either crucify Barabbas, who's a thief and a murderer, and surely they'll want to crucify him, or Jesus. Which one would you have me to crucify? The Sanhedrin goes out and filtrates the people, and they say, tell them to crucify Jesus. Tell them to crucify Jesus. And so the crowd begins to shout, crucify him, crucify him, crucify Jesus, king of the Jews. Well, they didn't like that when they called him king of the Jews, but they crucified him. Pilate, the judge, says, why? 
What evil has he done? Can you imagine a judge saying this? Why crucify him? What evil has he done? What has he really done to deserve this? They cry the more. And Pilate tries, the Bible says, Pilate tries his best to reason with them. In other words, he tries to say, listen, this is not worthy of death, guys. He's not worthy. He has done nothing worthy of death. But the people don't want to hear it. Finally, he asks for a basin of water. And they bring a basin of water. And he washes his hands and says, Listen, I am clean of the blood of this just man. He could never wash. He could never wash the blood of Jesus Christ off his hands. In fact, the oldest creed known to man is he was suffered and crucified under Pontius Pilate. Later on, Pilate could not sleep no more. He was warned of his wife in a dream not to crucify him, and he couldn't sleep. And then history bears it that he went off and jumped off the, uh, the, uh, the pinnacle of, of Hercules where he jumped and jumped to his death. What a terrible way to die. We see these seven trials take place in the voluntary walk of Jesus now. And I say voluntary. Why do I say voluntary walk? He was committed to Calvary and he had to go and die and suffer. Why do I call this a voluntary walk? Because Jesus at any time could have called 10,000 angels to his rescue. He could have said, I'm not going to do it. God, relieve me of this. And it would have been done. But Jesus now carrying his cross a half mile along the Via Della Rosa, to Golgotha Hill, the place of the skull, Calvary. Why? He could call 10,000 angels to his rescue, but no, he chose not to. He goes there to die for your sins and for mine. Why did he go? Why did he suffer so much? Why did he go? He died for your sins and he died for my sins. Think about that. To usher in the age of grace. We see the verbal sayings on the cross. He's on the cross dying. I want you to look very quickly three prayers of this. At the beginning, in the middle, in the end. The first saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's the prayer. Second saying is, Jesus says to John, Behold thy mother. Mother, behold thy son. The third saying is to the thief on the cross. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. The fourth saying is a prayer. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The fifth saying, he says in his humanity, I thirst. But the sixth saying in his deity says, it is finished. Praise God. He never said, I am finished. He said, it is finished. I with a cross behind it, amen. He said, I have finished the cross. Calvary is done. Salvation is complete. It is finished. Redemption for all mankind is paid for in full. And this brings us to the seventh and last saying. Now this caused controversy, this prayer. This prayer shook the earth. This prayer did something that no other prayer has ever done before and has never done since. For the Bible says at this time after this prayer, it says the earth did quake. If you look at that scripture and see, you'll find out it literally means that there's not only an earthquake in Jerusalem, not only on Mount Calvary, not only in Judea, not only in Samaria, but the uttermost parts of the earth quaked and shook at one, shook at one time. Hmm. Scientists say... For there to be the great fault lines and the cracks that we have in this earth, science says there had to be someday, somewhere in our creation, there had to be an earthquake that shook the whole earth. Well, scientists, may I show you and introduce you to Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen? I'm telling you, the day he breathed his last breath, when he made his last saying, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And the earth shook and did quake. Praise be to God. You know the amazing thing that took place at that very minute when he spoke these last words, right before the earthquake took place, Caiaphas was entering into the temple and getting ready to sacrifice the sacrificial lamb, the sinless lamb, for the people. Do you know the amazing thing that took place at this time when the earth did shake? The Bible says the veil was rent from top to bottom, amen? Can you imagine they had some trouble inside that temple that day, didn't they, amen? Woo! He's getting ready to slay the lamb and he can't slay the lamb. The temple is rent from top to bottom. No longer do we sacrifice the lambs of animals. For Jesus Christ is a permanent sacrifice. The lamb of the living God. Amen. This took place that day. 
Old Satan is saying, uh, he's, he's having a party. He's saying, boy, it's good. Friday, Friday we're crucifying him. Friday we're putting him to the cross. Friday we're nailing his hands and his feet there. Friday we're going to put death to the son of the living God. I say, old Satan, Friday you may have thought you had the winning hand, but Sunday's coming, amen? Sunday's coming. Keep drawing because you ain't won yet. Hmm. Praise be to God. I'm getting ahead of myself. We see number eight. His victorious resurrection. That's what we're celebrating today. His victorious resurrection. Easter, the third and glorious day. Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave and springs hope for the entire earth, for everyone, for you and me. Hope springs up because of Easter. Why do you love Easter so much? Because it's our day. Christians, Easter is our day. Everybody has a day. Easter is our day. I'm going to tell you, the Friday was the devil's day. He thought he did his best. That was his day. But listen, Friday was there, but Easter's coming. Sunday's coming. The first day of the week's coming. His victorious resurrection. We see the vindication in heaven, number one. In Hebrews 10, 12, it says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I want you to know he was vindicated. He said, listen, this is my son. And he completed Calvary on the cross. He, re he completed redemption for all mankind. Therefore, he is welcome into heaven. And he can sit down at my right hand. Praise be to God. He was vindicated in heaven. The veil was ripped. Someone ought to shout right there. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and other places is recorded. The veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. Not from the bottom to top, as man would rip, but from top to bottom. When God shook this earth, he rent the temple from top to bottom. What does that have to do with anything? It's saying away with the law, away with the sacrifice, away with the old, and in with the new. Aren't you glad for the Old Testament? I am, but I'm even more glad for the New Testament, amen? Aren't you glad for law? Yes, I am, but I'm even glad for the, the New Testament and grace, amen? Aren't you glad that God used to cover sin? Yes, I am. I'm glad He covered sin, but I'm even more glad that He cleanses sin today, amen? Praise be to God. The veil was ripped. We see the vacant tomb, not only the veil ripped, but the vacant tomb. Thank God for the vacant tomb. Amen. The sepulcher. This was a place, uh, his place of rest was a, it was honed into the wall of a rock and a hillside. A stone about two ton was brought into the doorway, rolled down into the doorway. A seal was placed. I tried once again to look on the seal. Some say it's the seal of the stone itself. Others believe it's a clay seal that they put around it. I would say probably because they were afraid someone would come and take it. It's probably a clay seal with an injection of a mark in it. So we see the seal. We see the sepulcher, the stone, the seal. And then the soldiers. There was a watch set for the soldiers. Three soldiers setting a watch over him. Friday, everything looked good for the devil. But Sunday was on the way. God did shake the earth with a great mega earthquake. An angel of the Lord came down. By the way, you remember when I told you about the earthquake that took place at, at Calvary? Huh? There's another earthquake that takes place now. And God says it's the third day. Hey, let me remind you that I said I'm coming back on the third day. Now, he didn't have to have an earthquake. He didn't need the earthquake to roll back the stone because the Bible said he sent an angel to roll back the stone. So the earthquake wasn't for that. The earthquake was to remind the world and to remind them that, hey, I'm still God. You thought you won on Friday? Hey, it's Sunday, man, and I'm alive. I come up out of the tomb. The tomb is empty. I'm not here. I have risen. Praise be to God. Amen. Jesus Christ has risen. He's alive today. Whew. Think about that. Sabbath and the law have to give way to Sunday and grace. Some of shall. The covering of sin has to give way to the cleansing of sin. The sacrificial lamb has to give way to the lamb of God. Are you lost? Jesus wants to save you. Here's what God said in John 3, 16. For God, by the way, he's the greatest giver. So love, that's the greatest motive. The world, that's the greatest object. That he gave, that's the greatest act. His only begotten, that's the greatest gift. That whosoever believeth in him, that's the greatest invitation. 
should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the greatest security. You want to be saved and born again and bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ? It's only by and through Jesus Christ. The blood he shed at Calvary and his victory over death, hell, and the grave because of Easter. That's who, who can save you today, who can cleanse you from your sin. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Praise be to God. We got two more. I'm not going to go over them, but you can look at the, the visible return. Remember? This same Jesus that you have seen go in like manner, he shall also come again. He's coming back. And then he's going to do what? He's, we're going to set up his vast kingdom. Maybe we'll look at those another day. I'm running out of time. I will close with this story. It says he is risen. It's written by R.A. Torrey. A great preacher of the past that writes this. And when I read this the other day, I kind of started to cry. And I thought, well, this would be a good thing to read. He writes, I was standing before the window of an art store where a picture of the crucifixion of the Lord was on exhibition. As I gazed, I was conscious of an approach of another behind me, and turning, behold, a little lad gazing also intently on this picture. Noticing that this might of a humanity was a sort of street Arab, I thought I would, I would speak to him. So I asked him, pointing to the picture, Do you know who he is? Yes, came a quick response. That's our Savior, with a mingled look of pity and surprise that I should not that I should not know what the picture represented. With an evident desire to enlighten me further, he continued after a pause. He continued to talk to him. Things of the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, and with a, uh, and, uh, with a long drawn sigh. That woman crying there is his mother, by the way. The little lad told him. He waited apparently for me to question him farther, then thrust his hand into his pocket and with a reverent and subdued voice and tear-stained face added, They killed him, mister. Yes, sir. They killed him. I looked at the little dirty ragged fellow and asked, Where did you learn all this, son? He replied, At the Mission Sunday School, sir. Full of thoughts regarding the benefits of Mission Sunday School, I turned to resume my walk, leaving the little lad still looking on at the picture. I had not walked a block when I heard the little when I when I heard his childish tremble calling, Mister, Mister, Mister. I turned. He was running toward me, but he paused. Then up went his little hand, and with a triumph sound in his voice and now radiant face, he said, I wanted to tell you. He rose again. He rose again. His message delivered. He smiled, he waved his hand, and he turned and went his way. Feeling, I presume, that as he had been enlightened, he had done this duty in enlightening another, which would be me. What a challenge to everyone for us. Would you please, if you know Jesus Christ, if you know that he rose again, would you tell somebody else? And if you don't know him, why don't you know him? Come to know him today as they come and get a song.